Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I was told to pause while the video was turned on. And second, I was asked to ask you whether you can all hear me. I have a voice like a foghorn that can go up several decibels if you want it to. <laughs> I'm also going to uh, break a cardinal rule and give an apology before I even start, which is that uh, Dacre was excavated 30 years ago now, uh, and w the publication was wrecked on the shoals of promotion. I suspect several of you might know that, that syndrome. And it's only now, as I approach retirement, that I'm coming back to, to actually see it to publication with the help of funding from Historic England, for which I'm very grateful. But what this means is that um, the slides that I'm going to show you were, are all at least 30 years old and have converted with some lack of success, I suspect, to uh, PowerPoint. So I apologise in advance for those old slides that look a little horrible to you. I hope you'll forgive me. When I joined the Cumbria and Lancashire Archaeological Unit, which uh, I do agree with Tim, it sounds as though I've worked for three separate organisations. They're actually the same organisation transmogrifying itself over the years. But when I joined uh, the Cumbria and Lancashire Archaeological Org um, Unit, I um, didn't know much about the North West, and even less, despite the fact that I was an early medievalist by training, about the early medieval period in the North West, mostly because nobody did. Um, there was a real blank. And I'm pleased to say that over the 30 years, nothing to do with me particularly, but over the last 30 years, things have changed. So I want to slightly wind out the, my lecture a little bit, not just to talk about Dacre, but to put Dacre now in the context of some archaeology that has appeared in the meantime, as opposed to uh, where we started, which was that Dacre was almost the only bit of archaeology that we knew about. And indeed, um, when I joined the unit, it was only just beginning to be excavated and was the first early medieval site really to be excavated. It was running neck and neck with a, a, a rural site called Bryant's Gill up in the Kentmere Valley, but otherwise there was no early medieval excavated archaeology in Cumbria after about 1822. We started potentially with an advantage in that, um, as it says in the title, uh, there is a monastery at Dacre, wherever Dacre might be, that is to a certain extent described by the Venerable Bede, although I wish he had described it as opposed to mentioned the fact that it existed. Um, basically what Bede says is that there was a monastery uh, that was built by the river Dacre and took its name from the same. Now in the north of England, there are two Dacres. Just to be totally confusing, there is one uh, in Yorkshire near Pateley Bridge. The other is in Cumbria near Pooley Bridge. Uh, but it was generally assumed that it was the Dacre in Cumbria that was the um, monastery mentioned by Bede. And that was because Dacre is pretty unique in that it has not one documentary reference, but two documentary references, although the second one is somewhat later, in that William of Malmesbury mentions it uh, in the 12th century, which is quite interesting in itself, William of Malmesbury being a monk in the West Country. And what he says is that a meeting of the kings called by Athelstan in 927, Itimotum at Emont, uh, mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, was linked to Dacre, William of Malmesbury saying that the son of the King of Scots, Constantine, was baptised in that holy place. Now this is interesting in itself, in that how did William of Malmesbury know that Dacre, near Pooley Bridge in Cumbria, was close to Itimotum, generally translated as Emont Bridge, although Emont Bridge didn't exist at that point, um, but we'll draw a veil over that. But Dacre is very close to the River Emont. And indeed, if you look uh, sensibly at 
the possible meeting places for Athelstan at a river, presumably the border of his kingdom at that stage, um, Dacre is one of the possibilities, as is indeed the Roman fort at Broome, and indeed perhaps uh, Penrith, which seems to have an early medieval foundation, although we've signally failed to find any firm evidence for early medieval activity there, except for some very fine, um, both Anglian, Northumbrian, and more substantially, um, Scandinavian-styled uh, sculpture. The reason why Dacre is often thought to be, indeed is, was thought to be the uh, monastery by Bede, was because it too has sculpture, of which perhaps the nicest piece, although that is disputable, it depends on your taste in sculpture, um, is a, a fragment of a cross shaft, uh, which is Northumbrian, probably 9th century, and was found around 1900 uh, being used as a door sill uh, in Dacre Castle, which is just a few hundred yards away from the churchyard. And it was said to have been found when di uh, dra digging drains close to the church. Slightly earlier, in 1875, uh, the east end of the church was being refurbished, and out of the wall came this, which is slightly later, probably 10th century, and a very, very fine piece of Scandinavian iconography, known as the Dacre Stone, because the, um, the vicar of the time knew about William of Malmesbury and thought that these two people, which I hope you can see, don't know whether I'm, whoops, sorry, done that wrong. Um, now what have I done? Um, I don't know whether you can see there are two people apparently holding hands under the back-turning beast, second, second vision down. Uh, he thought that these actually represented the baptism of Constantine's son, and it became known as the Dacre Stone. Richard Bailey has reinterpreted this as the sacrifice of Isaac, and indeed, because of that, and also the Adam and Eve scene at the bottom of the, uh, of the stone, has stressed the sophistication of the iconography of this stone, which indeed calls some question to our traditional belief that monasteries, Northumbrian monasteries, somehow died at the time of the Scandinavian influence in, in the north of England, because this is quite clearly a Scandinavian influenced stone and is showing considerable um, sophistication. The other thing that was slightly odd about Dacre is uh, in 1704, Bishop Nicholson, the Bishop of Carlisle, visited the site and stated in his records that there is a bear at each of the four corners of the churchyard. Now these bears have an interesting history. Everybody has denied them uh, one way and another. Um, I can remember vividly the Medieval Archaeology Society coming up to the site back in 1984, which is showing my age, um, and the early medievalists denying that these were early medieval and the medievalists denying that they were medieval. They are something of a mystery, but we know they've been in the churchyard since 1704 and are distinctly interesting. I personally think they are old and interesting. Uh, they're known as the Dacre Bears, as after Bishop Nicholson, but personally, I don't think that is a bear. There we go. It also has quite an interesting tufty tail. Back in the 1980s, it was noticed that um, after many, many years, uh, the churchyard was being extended. It seems to have been extended in the 19th century to the south, um, but it was extended around 1950 to the north. And uh, the then director of the unit, Roger Leach, and the then county archaeologist, Tom Clare, noted that there were earthworks in the fields around the church. And as a result, particularly since these earthworks were seen to disappear into the area that had now been consecrated, um, it was decided that some excavations should take place, indeed to test the, the possibility that this was the um, monastery referred to by Bede. And over the course of several years, uh, several areas were excavated. Um, let me see whether I can make this work. Uh, one area was here, 
uh, where a new house was going to be built in what was known as the orchard. Uh, the large area of consecrated land to the north of the church. And back in 1985, uh, a small excavation in the south of the churchyard, which I will come back to shortly. The orchard, in some ways, proved somewhat disappointing. There was no problem with the house being, being built there because most of the archaeology was up at the very top corner, uh, closest to the churchyard. And indeed, that was tantalisingly interesting uh, but very limited in what we could say, in that the earliest feature was a ditch that curved round and seemed to follow whoops, follow the curve of a bank within the churchyard. So it came up through there. It clearly predated um, a wall, which in turn predated a stone wall which was very similar to the medieval churchyard boundary, which you can just see peeping over the top of that head there. So it looked as though the churchyard had been slightly uh, truncated at this point, perhaps by the building of a small building just to the east of this potential churchyard wall, uh, which I'd like to think, but is total, you know, maybe not total fantasy, but, but is wishful thinking on my part, that it could have been something like a priest's house that had secularised that part of the churchyard. So I say, that churchyard boundary post-dated the most tantalising bit of archaeology. I would love to be able to knock down the churchyard wall, which is here. This rather nicely built uh, yellow sandstone wall that just peeps into the churchyard at an acute angle, sorry, out of the churchyard at an acute angle, and it is buttered by what looked like the um, medieval churchyard wall. So it looked as though there were changes in the churchyard at that point. And if we were right in the dating of the churchyard wall, all predating probably the 13th century. Now, why did we think the 13th century? Well, I shall come to that in time. The much larger excavation was to the north of the churchyard, um, the medieval churchyard, the wall of which ran very close to the church. This is only half of the excavation. By the time we were finished, we'd excavated the whole of this area. At first, the information was very weird, to say the least, in that, as you might have noticed, the churchyard is on a, uh, a couple of terraces, indeed, three terraces in total, an upper terrace in the new churchyard, the terrace on which the the church sits and a lower terrace um, which was taken into the churchyard in the, in the 19th century and continues beyond down to a little beck where there are more earthworks showing. So on the upper terrace there was this tantalising mess, mishmash of uh, ridges and hollows within the, the um, natural subsoil. And to cut a very long story short, uh, that resolved itself in time into quite a closely packed cemetery that was both on the upper terrace and dropping down onto the lower terrace. It's not that there was a sudden lack of graves just there, but there was a, a later ditch that cut away all sign of uh, graves there. As you can see, they seem to be packing towards the south of the, uh, of the site and seem to be focusing on something perhaps somewhere around here, which is perhaps unsurprisingly, the area of the junction between the nave and chancel of the present medieval parish church. In total, there were, uh, we could work out 234 graves. Now, why, when they're graves, and particularly when you've heard the fascinating dissertation about the amount of work you can do on bodies, why am I being so vague? Well, the problem is that in Cumbria, uh, the soils are so acid that bodies don't survive. That, I am sad to say, is the most complete skeleton in the whole of the 234 graves. But it's amazing what you can do with a little bit of evidence, because those teeth were at the west end of graves, which I hope you could see were aligned east-west. There were no grave goods. All the graves that we could see were quite large. They were at least one and a half metres long, probably more like two metres long for many of them. 
and the, as I say, the teeth were at the, at the uh, western end, and there was just enough showing when you really teased it out to suggest that the bodies that the teeth belonged to were lying supine in, in these graves. So there was nothing to suggest that these weren't Christian cemetery, that it wasn't a Christian cemetery. And when you started working that out and so on, you could, you could start to see patterns. So, for instance, you could see there was order within the cemetery, uh, but also quite close packing. As you can see here, there's a whole series of graves that are on the same alignment, following the same, basically, row, <coughs> and um, in, in sort of packing in amongst themselves. There was also evidence of some longevity to the cemetery in that some graves cut other graves. And then the tantalising thing was, um, this was something of a puzzle to start off with because this seemed to be natural subsoil, as was that, but that rather dark stain was clearly not natural at all. And then the penny dropped that actually it was the side of a coffin or chest burial, if you want to, to be totally PC about it, um, that had collapsed inwards, uh, bringing the, the natural of the terrace edge down on top of it. And that started to make sense of a, a large amount of ironwork that had been found within the area, of which this is the most complete version, which, as you can see, is a very nice uh, hinge to a box. Uh, very classically uh, Northumbrian in style, and um, at that stage dated to the 9th, 10th century. Thanks to the work of Elizabeth Craig Atkins, however, this style of, of um, chest hinge has been redated considerably earlier, and she contends that these are very much high status burials, apart from an outlier in Hereford only found in Northumbria, uh, mostly in Yorkshire, but then isn't most, most things mostly found in Yorkshire, but um, God's own county after all. Um, but as you can see, it has uh, corrosion products which show the timber and it quite clearly was fossilised as the box lid just quietly collapsed. But not content with having quite clear boxes with nice hinges, um, there were also these. Um, there were about 11 locks, all of them locked, which is interesting in itself, um, again suggesting a quality of chest in the um, being used for burial that was really quite unusual. And as I say, it's proving now that the work has been done to, to compare, the, look at the comparanda, that these are extremely unusual. The cemetery didn't go right to the north the northeast corner of the site, nor did it go as far as the eastern end of the present churchyard. It stopped rather annoyingly just at the point where about, well, shall we say to be on the safe side, four, five hundred years later, someone built a small farmstead, including this, which was seemingly a turf-walled medieval building. The farmstead is more down towards where the, the, the uh, photographs have been taken. Up at the top end of the, of the site, where the earthworks had come into the cemetery, we're showing in the cemetery, sadly that also proved that the earthworks were medieval in this part of the, of the site. At the western end of the, the cemetery, however, there was some stratigraphy. I hope you can see graves that all respect this line of stones. The line of stones being a tantalising fragment of what seemed to be a wall foundation. Sadly, this rather disturbed area here is where the uh, post-medieval graves uh, ended, so was really out of bounds for excavation, and it was cut just at the point it looked as though it was turning by a ditch, a later ditch, um, certainly it didn't go to the north of that area. As I say, it did look as though this wall was turning, perhaps suggesting some form of entrance or something respecting what was going on to the south, which of course is out of bounds with the uh, present parish church. <coughs> 
but the graves didn't, didn't go beyond it. So quite clearly it was some form of marker to the edge of the cemetery. The graves, as I say, were clustered in this area um, and were quite clearly sealed by a bank that had been thrown up from the ditch I mentioned earlier uh, that had been cut through it and in effect deconsecrated the land uh, at some stage in its later history. There wasn't a lot of dating evidence to go with this back and ditch. It was a ceramic, which is interesting itself, and I should have said that the northwest is happily a ceramic until probably the 12th century. There's some argument that there might be some um, ceramics coming in at the late 11th century, but even in places like Carlisle, there's almost nothing until the 12th century. So it suggested that this was quite early, uh, a theory reinforced by the fact that the medieval churchyard wall was built on top of it. And in its foundations, there were coins of John and early issues of the reign of Henry III. So it does suggest that this wall, at any rate, was probably built in the 13th century, which suggests that this bank and ditch, presumably also um, at that stage bounding the nascent parish church, was somewhat earlier. I mean, it would be nice to think that this might be, if you like, the Norman refounding, the Norman rebuilding of, of the... Uh, the parish church, but again, there's no clear evidence to suggest that. As I'm sure you s saw, um, the bank was really quite stony because it had disturbed in part a major stone scatter uh, un that was underneath it to the west of our fabled churchyard boundary. And this stone scatter contained uh, quite a lot of metalwork and it also seemed to respect a building, um, which unfortunately, again, it's the story of Dacre's life, stuck out from the edge of the, uh, of the excavation, from the area that had already been buried. If only the site could have been looked at 20 years earlier, I think we would have found a lot more. But this was possibly upsidely ended. It could have been D-shaped. We really don't know, but it had a curving edge to it coming into the trench, and it had as a focus within the area we could excavate a hearth, uh, red sandstone hearth that, when it got tired, was replaced by this um, millstone being used as a hearth. It also had several fragments of early medieval window glass, very similar to uh, material that Ros Rosemary Cramp excavated at Wearmouth and Jarrow. So it looks as though it was a building of some status. And as I say, it and the stones spread next to it were associated with what at that stage was the largest collection of early medieval metalwork from Cumbria, which means that there were 19 pieces, but nevertheless quite smart pieces, if you can call nail pins like this smart, but uh, nice spatula-headed <coughs> pins, uh, purse clasp, a baluster-headed pin, all 8th, 9th, 10th century in date, a nice 8th century uh, gilded strap end, and probably the earliest piece of metalwork, this little um, uh, buckle, which was at that stage dated by um, Dominic Tweddle to the, um, probably the late 6th, 7th century. This is just giving you a, a little run through. Uh, that is about the most complete Stiker. There were six Stikers and one Shatter from the site, uh, mostly mid 9th century. Uh, Archbishop Wolfstan, uh, the second reign of Ethelred II, uh, the earliest being about 820 from the Eanred's reign. And this amazing early medieval knuckle duster, you could really put somebody's eye out with that. And also the ubiquitous. Uh, mixture of um, melon beads. I'm afraid that hasn't come out well, for which I apologise, because it is probably the most interesting bead on the site, in that it's one of these, uh, like a stick of rock, that you see in places like Cheesecake Hill in York, and indeed a lot are found on, uh, in the Dover Cemetery, and they're known there as sword beads. Now, this came from a site that otherwise wasn't producing finds of anything to speak of, um, so it does beg the question of quite what it was doing there, but it's a very sophisticated um, bead 
from, with Merovingian um, origins. And there was also this beautiful, uh, finely turned uh, stone spindle wall. Up at the top end of the site, there was a, perhaps a more conventional rectangular building, again with little in the way of finds. Given that we were finding post hole medieval buildings further over, the jury is slightly out. Uh, I've erred towards the fact that it is likely to be early medieval, because it's in the early medieval corridor, if you like, um, but it could just be medieval in date, because uh, as I say, the finds aren't exactly great in, in Cumbria at the best of times, even in the medieval period. So it was quite clear we had an early medieval site of some size and potential sophistication, uh, and indeed of um, ecclesiastical origin. The other piece of evidence that had suggested that there was an early medieval site on the, uh, um, here before we started excavating was a find in the south part of the church back in the late 1920s, which was excavated and published in the Transactions of the Cumberland Westmoreland Antiquarian and Archaeological Society. You see, I've had a lot of practice over the last three years in saying it without <laughs> falling over. Um, which was, when excavated, thought to be uh, a, the ubiquitous tunnel to the castle. Doesn't every castle have one? However, when it was excavated, it proved to be far more exciting in that it turned out to be a drain, indeed two drains coming together in a single channel, which doesn't take the fastest, shortest route down to a water source, but indeed curves round just behind the, photog the photo photographer and disappears off to the east as though it's servicing and respecting things that are happening to the, church, uh, to the area to the south of the church. So if I ever won the lottery, you know where I'd be looking to go. The drain itself is really interesting and even more interesting because Huddleston quite clearly only excavated over the top of it. Uh, this actually represents the edge of the 1929-30 trench. So everything that came out of the backfill must have come out of the drain or over the top of it. It's made of reused stones, which Peter Hill has very confidently uh, suggested are badly reworked Roman stones, perhaps from a bridge, perhaps from a mill, which again is a tantalising hint of other things that are going on in the Dacre area, because I hardly think they'd have moved these stones that far. There are two sorts, uh, one like that, and you'll see all of them have a Lewis hole in their roughened side. The other type like that, sort of like a fat uh, mushroom, and this one had what can only be thought of as something approaching a mason's mark on it. Uh, it was the only mark, but nevertheless is interesting. So we have a drain made of reused Roman stones. And out of the Huddleston backfill came that little collection, of which the most pretty, for a girl like me, uh, was the, the gold ring. The most interesting are this escutcheon, which seems to have come off something organic. Uh, could it be a book? I don't know. Uh, but most exciting of all, this um, stylus, which is very clearly early medieval in, in date. Now, it would be very easy to uh, just say, bead <laughs> recorded a monastery at Dacre, we're at Dacre, we found early medieval, this must be the monastery. But if you look at it critically, we have a cemetery uh, predating a, a parish church, we have, yes, Northumbrian sculpture, which does push us in that direction. Um, we have continuing sculpture, and we have the documentary references. But I think that the one find that really seals it is the fact that we have clear evidence of literacy. And I don't know whether any of, the of, of you were watching uh, Digging for Britain last night, but it was very interesting that it was the evidence of literacy that was pushing the new site found in Lincolnshire towards potentially being monastic, although they didn't quite go that far, because the real problem is 
how do you actually prove it unless you have a Monk Wearmouth or a Jarrow where you have standing structures that are early medieval that are quite clearly ecclesiastical you have um, documentary evidence for the site the tantalising thing about Dacre is that the things that say Jarrow and Monk Wearmouth here Monk Wearmouth uh, are monastic the buildings on the, uh, the terrace to the south of the church are not available at Dacre. Well, not available in the areas that we were able to dig. It's why I'd like to dig the field to the south if I ever got the chance, but it's not threatened by anything, sadly. Um, you can see I'm a commercial archaeologist <laughs> by long, long training. Get it threatened and then you can dig it. Um, but it is interesting when you lo also look at Jarrow, uh, these buildings to the south of the church that if you project that drain back up the slope it one arm goes somewhere to the west of the church and the other arm goes somewhere here could just be interesting but unfortunately people have been buried in that part of the churchyard for about a thousand years if not somewhat more so um, it can only ever be a tantalising hint Whatever, the early medieval site ceases to exist by the medieval period. As I've said, it's cut by a ditch that runs along here that was fronting a big uh, stone-covered bank which subsequently has the churchyard wall until 1950 built on top of it. As I've said, at, that st at this stage, at the stage we ceased to excavate, um, it was the only excavated site in, the, in Cumbria. We did know quite a lot of uh, early medieval activity, mostly from the stone sculpture that existed, which clusters along the west coast and also up the Eden Valley. And there's Dacre. I know it's a bit small. And this, by the way, is e the Emod, Itimotum. Since then, well, there were one or two other things to suggest um, there was activity, but none of it had been excavated in, the, um, in a, a modern professional way, if you like, uh, in that uh, a grave had been found at Ormskirk and antiquarians had found evidence of Viking burials at Rampside right down here, uh, at Aspatria and at Hescott in the forest. But there really was nothing but the sculpture at that stage, of which the sculpture is incredibly fine, after all. Uh, some of the best sculpture in the, in the country at places such as the Bucastle Cross here. The documentary sources mention potentially, um, other than Dacre, only two other, well, three other monasteries. Um, there is a reference to uh, the abbot of Heversham, which some people have claimed is Hesham near Lancaster, uh, fleeing in front of the Vikings. And that's right down in the south end of the county. And uh, the anonymous life of St Cuthbert says that St Cuthbert, the saint, came to, to Carlisle and saw uh, water systems still in, in use uh, when he came with the Queen to um, consecrate a, a, a monastery somewhere. Now, Rosemary Cramp would believe that uh, the evidence of literacy, hence my saying that the stylus is the most important thing that, in some ways, that came out of Dacre, is uh, good evidence of a, mon a monastery. And whilst it's now illegible, the uh, Bucastle Cross has quite a large inscription and it also has uh, a sundial. And I can't believe that uh, if you have a sundial, you're not wanting to tell the hours. And why do you want to tell the hours unless you're performing church services? Since then, however, the flesh has started to, to uh, creep slowly into the area, particularly around the Eden Valley, the Emont Eden, Eden Valley. And here we come to commercial archaeology, a pipeline going <coughs> through the uh, Eden Valley, uh, which supposedly was, it was supposed to find Bronze Age activity, but it actually found a clamp kiln with making handmade pottery, which was thought at to be Bronze Age at first, but uh, there's reasons why I don't think it was, because it also produced 
the, the site also produced these, which um, are, to my mind, as far as I am aware, the only uh, Grubenhauser sunken featured buildings in the northwest at the moment. You could argue about the Manchester um, building, but it's a bit weird. And then, of course, the Chester sunken uh, structures are later and seem to be cellars. We had four of these sunken featured buildings. Now, the problem is trying to date sites like this. It also produced a purse clasp which was very similar to the Dacre one, so it is conceivable that a site like this was contemporary. It also annoyingly produced what seemed to be the corner of a hall-type building that was mostly out of the excavation. We had about three square feet of it in the excavation. But it is suggesting, um, if we didn't already think that, that the routeway over Stainmore, which was a Roman road, um, was still an important routeway between, if you like, the heartlands of the Northumbrian Kingdom and the West. Later, however, um, it still seems to be a route of some importance. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that recently, well, 10 years ago, uh, another Viking Age site came up, uh, a cemetery just to the north of, of um, Dacre, of six graves. I know you can only see five of them there, but there was one slightly out at, on a limb. Um, all furnished and all of the early 10th century. Now, why am I warbling on about 10th century Viking burials? Well, it's because the, um, this is only about 16 miles away from Dacre. We have evidence in the 10th century stone that there was religious activity in Dacre. And here is a completely different community still burying in a, uh, a pagan fashion, although perhaps on the cusp of Christianity. Um, and if you remember the metalwork I showed you from Dacre, wearing a completely different sort of uh, buckles and belt fittings and so on, you wouldn't think that they were inhabiting the same space, and yet they're 16 miles apart. And that must be saying something about what is going on in the melting pot of Cumbria in the 10th century. When, uh, as Fiona Edmonds has said in, uh, fairly recently, the political history is completely baffling in what's going on uh, with influence from the north, influence from the east, a Viking influence, uh, the fading uh, power of Northumbria, and indeed the growing power of Wessex becoming the Kingdom of England. However, this completely different uh, way of, of dressing goes with antiquarian sources, the Viking burial at Hesket in the, in the forest, which is only a few miles from, from Cumwitton, where the cemetery was found, uh, which again is shown this very different type of uh, cultural assemblage. Slightly further north in Carlisle, however, we get onto much more familiar territory for Dacre, in that there is good 8th, 9th century uh, expanded armed crosses, and also evidence for literacy. So it has generally been assumed that um, Cuthbert came to consecrate something here that is reflected in the stone sculpture. Even in Carlisle, however, although there is evidence, tantalising evidence, of some activity continuing in the Roman town, it's still fairly scattered and centering on the area that later became the cathedral. And indeed, uh, I'm sure many of you will have read um, the article by Mike McCarthy, uh, publishing the material to the west of the cathedral, of which this is uh, one piece of metalwork. And I hope you, were, uh, you noticed that the Cumwitten material is very similar to this. Um, so we've got a mishmash of, of contending views and, and cultures um, happening in the north of Cumbria. It begs the question, as did the Digging for Britain um, programme yesterday, of when is a monastery a monastery? And uh, we now have one of those two at St Michael's Church, Workington, which is at the mouth of the River Derwent, which potentially has a, um, 
a documentary reference to it in that many of you, I'm sure, are aware that um, in the political unrest of the um, late 9th, early 10th century, uh, eventually the, the monks of Lindisfarne decided to abandon the, the site and went a wandering with the body of St Cuthbert for a considerable period. And at one stage they decided it was so bad that they uh, would leave Britain and go to Ireland. But the saint didn't like this and blew up a storm which pushed them back into the mouth of the Derwent, which is interesting when you see this medieval uh, parish church um, at the mouth of the Derwent, uh, sitting on a, a rise just above it, uh, which was sadly uh, subject to arson uh, about getting on for 20 years ago. And in the course of being rebuilt, it produced bodies, and some of it uh, seemingly early, predating the, the medieval parish church, uh, and some actually stacked at least four bodies deep, so some longevity. There was also some evidence for uh, literacy, in that there is some um, sto there are some stones with, with writing on. And there was then, which was thought to be uh, the first medieval, some bodies in stone kists, which are interesting in themselves, uh, because there are arguments about what, when is a stone kist a stone kist, what date is it? Um, there are stone kists known from Cumbria from probably the 6th century, or indeed, I think now with the Mary Court finding there are stone kists from the 3rd century, maybe early 4th century onwards. But these were taken to be medieval. However, um, thanks to historic England, while there was still English heritage, uh, we were able, because this is a rare site in Cumbria in that it does have bone survival, we were able to do some radiocarbon dating on this site. And the body I first showed you, oops, mm -hmm. on the left has been dated uh, to 605 to 670 AD. Uh, now, to my mind, that is the earliest dated body pretty much, certainly in Cumbria, uh, I mean from the early medieval period, if not something else. And it's really interesting because it comes from a period before the great growth of uh, early medieval monasticism. So that is interesting itself. Our other body, the one at the bottom of the pile of four, is dated 670 to 770. Interesting in itself. So, you know, we have a very clearly dated um, sequence of Northumbrian activity here. Now, why am I warbling on about that? Because um, we've also had some dates from the um, kiss burials, and they are coming out uh, in the early 11th century all of them. And indeed, Peter Marshall got terribly excited um, of the HE dating team because he could model all of them, which is about 10, uh, to the first 50 years, the first half of the 11th century. So to my mind, for the first time, we actually have two phases of early medieval burial at St Michael's Church, Workington, which perhaps is unsurprising when, when you look at the, the um, the first stone I showed you, and these which are clearly, again, Scandinavian in uh, influence, including uh, a little bit of a hogback, although really unusually, um, mostly with hogbacks, the beast turns inwards, but here you can see the beast is looking outwards, uh, which is only seen at uh, a very close site called Cross Cannonby, <coughs> otherwise. So what have we got? It all seemed so simple when we had Dacre and only Dacre, uh, in that we had uh, a site that was referenced by the Venerable Bede. We were supplying early medieval information to, to that site. Um, but now the picture is, A, getting more interesting, in that we have more sites where we can actually show through excavation early medieval ecclesiastical activity, as well as other burial activity. But it has made the situation more complex. It has begged the question of, is the evidence we have at St Michael's Church Workington enough to suggest that this is monastic, at least in its original form? What happens in the 10th century 
is this the development from a monastic community, or at least a community of, of priests, uh, through to something approaching a parish church, as you see the change to Scandinavian sculpture? What's the relationship of the pagan burials at Cumwitten and indeed at Hesket in the Forest to this Scandinavian influence and the clear 11th century burials at St Michael's, perhaps at Ormskirk as well? To me, I, I'm not providing any answers today. That's something that's going to come out of the next few, few months, I hope, as I, I work my way back into being an archaeologist as opposed to an editor. Um, and, uh, but it is making the whole thought about what's happening in the 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th centuries in Cumbria far more interesting and moving away from the comment of Nick Hyam back in 1986 that there was nothing there. Indeed, uh, to be more, even more uh, dramatic, um, the uh, review of archaeology in the north in 1976 uh, that was published uh, by Clack and Gosling said that as far as they were concerned, the only uh, sane solution is that there was nobody in Cumbria in the early medieval <laughs> period. I hope I've proved that the case is very different. Uh, we've got a long way to go, but we have now a lot of information that is worthy of more um, national interest, shall we say. Thank you very much.